Tonight's Vesaka Puja. Vesaka is the name of the month, which straddles May and June. Puja means homage. No, we're not paying homage to the month. We're paying homage to some events that happened in this month. There's a full moon of Vesaka that the Buddha was born. And then 35 years later, on the full moon of Vesaka, he came to awakening. Then 45 years after that, on the full moon in Vesaka, he passed away into total nibbana. So we're paying homage to the Buddha. Just now what we did in the candle circumambulation is called a Misa Puja, where you pay homage with material things, and the flowers, candles, incense. They say that on the the night of the Buddha's passing away, the devas were sprinkling incense from the heavens, sprinkling flowers. And the Buddha said that this is not the way that you properly show homage to the Buddha. There's nothing wrong with it, but the best homage is the homage to the practice. Practice of the Dharma in accordance with the Dharma. That's how you pay true homage to the Buddha. So that's what we should be doing now. He taught right mindfulness, he taught right concentration, so we try to practice right mindfulness, right concentration. He taught right view, we try to develop right views. And we inform our practice by reflecting on these events, particularly the awakening. That was the big event. When the Buddha talks about conviction, Conviction in the Buddha. It's not as much in him as a person, it's conviction in his awakening. That's the central event. This is what makes his birth an important birth and allowed his final passing away to be a passing away into total nibbana. And his awakening was one of those events, in fact, it's probably the major event in human history that shapes other events. So you want to take that event into the story of your life, and take your life into the story of the Buddha's awakening. What that means is you try to inform your actions by what he awakened to, and then you think about your life as a whole in light of his awakening. He said that he awakened to many, many things. One time he was going through a forest, a Simsapa forest. There's some some supper trees have these tiny, tiny leaves that are like little dimes. He picked up a handful. He says, which is more, the, the leaves in my hand or the leaves in the forest? And the monk said, of course, the leaves in the forest. He said in the same way, what I awakened to is like the leaves in the forest. What I taught was like the leaves in my hand. And what he taught was basically the Four Noble Truths, because that knowledge was useful for putting an end to suffering. The other things he gained awakening to? might have been interesting, but they wouldn't have been as useful. So we think about what he had to say about his awakening. In the shortest explanation, he said he awakened to the deathless, that there is something deathless that can be attained through human efforts. In a more elaborate account, he talked about gaining three knowledges. He first learned how to divide his thinking into two sorts, skillful and unskillful. Encourage the skillful thoughts, discourage the unskillful ones. He found that he could get his mind to think nothing but skillful thoughts. But then thinking skillful thoughts all the time, even that would tire the mind. And you, know what happens, you know what happens to the mind when it's tired? It starts thinking unskillful things again. So he rested in concentration, entered the four jhanas. And based on the fourth jhana, he began to gain knowledge. The first knowledge that he reported was knowledge of his previous lives, back many, many, many aeons. There was one time when he talked about people who had limited knowledge of past lives. And for him, limited meant forty aeons, and each aeon is basically the lifetime of a universe. So his knowledge was much more extensive than that. And he saw himself 
dying and being reborn, dying and being reborn many, many times. He said it was like standing up in a high place next to a village square and then looking down, seeing people going from one house, going, leaving one house, going to another house, and then leaving that house, going to another house. And there was no pattern. Many of us like to think that as we go through lifetime after lifetime that we gain more knowledge and we go higher and higher, but it's not the case. You go up and then you go down. Then you struggle to get back up again, then you fall down again, over and over and over again. That knowledge led to a sense of dispassion, but then he had, still had more questions. What caused it to go up and down like that? Then he gained his second knowledge, knowledge of beings throughout the universe. And there are many levels in the universe from the lowest hells up to the very highest heavens. He saw beings dying and being reborn in line with their actions. Their actions were informed by their intentions and their intentions by their views. Again, he saw that it went nowhere, just over and over and over again. Strong feeling of dispassion. So he clearly wanted a way out. That was what the third knowledge was. The way out was seeing things in terms of the Four Noble Truths. In other words, because your actions are informed by views, what kind of views would lead to the type of actions that would be able to take you out? And there are these four views that we chanted this, this evening now. The truth of suffering, the truth of its cause, origination, the truth of its cessation, that it can be put an end to, and the truth of it, the path, path of practices the triple training, virtue, concentration, discernment, that can lead to the end of suffering. You notice that in his previous knowledges he was thinking in terms of people and worlds. But in the third knowledge it was simply events in the mind. This pattern you see throughout the Buddhist teachings. In some cases he describes narratives, or speaks in narrative terms. In other cases, he speaks in terms of a worldview. This is how the world works. Particularly, this is how karma, this is how action works in the world. And then there's an analysis of what goes on in the mind, right here in the present moment. So the way the Buddha came to awakening and the knowledges that he reported have had a huge impact on what we know of the Buddhist teachings, because these are the three modes in which he talked. And these are the three modes in which we should look at our own lives. Because that third knowledge led to the experience of the deathless, total unbinding, total freedom, the end of the rebirth, end of that cycle again and again and again. It was finally over. Because he had seen that this, there was nothing accomplished by dying and being reborn, because each time we're born, you place a burden on other people, other beings, except when you go up to the highest heavens. But even there, that can't last. You fall down again. You develop good qualities and then you enjoy the results of good qualities. It's like samsara is a sick joke. You work really hard to develop good qualities of the mind, and then when the rewards come, they eat away at your good qualities, take you back down again. So there's a suffering inside you and there's a suffering you're imposing on others, which is why he had that sense of dispassion. He wanted a way out. He found the way out. This is why this is such an important event. We live in a world where someone has found a way to put an end to suffering, and that should involve our views of ourselves as well, thinking in terms of Three knowledges. We've been through many lifetimes, too. It wasn't just him. And the way we go up and down depends on our actions. But there are ways of acting that can lead to the end of suffering. That should be the framework with which you look at your own life. So you bring the Buddhist teachings into the story of your life to inform them that what are the possibilities that you have now that you've been born as a human being. 
What are you capable of doing? And what are you doing with your life now? Try to keep the Buddha's awakening in mind. This is why recollection of the Buddha is an important part of the practice. You think about what he awakened to. And it's not just a story, it's not just an archetype, a nice myth. The way he told the story, he would tell his story, was meant to inform. This is what you do. This is what he had done. The implication being, well, this is what you can do, too. Some people have found it ironic that Buddhism, with its teachings on that self, also spawned the world's first autobiographies. The Buddha's own account counts of his awakening. There's nothing ironic there at all. Because his main teaching was karma, that human action can make a difference. And look, this is the kind of difference it can make, he's saying. He said that Nadama, Ehipasiko, come and look, come and see. Look, this is what human beings can do with their actions. This is what the Buddha did. This is what it's possible for us to do. So keep that in mind. And then putting our lives in the context of his story. We've come many generations later, but the story is still around. We're still living in a world where these teachings are alive. And they can be so easily wiped out. He himself said they wouldn't last forever. He said that there had been previous Buddhas, and their teachings had finally disappeared. In some cases, just after a couple of generations, others lasted longer. And what keeps the teaching alive, he said? Respect for the Buddha, respect for the Dhamma, respect for the Sangha, respect for the path of practice. When we have these kinds of respect, this is what keeps the Dhamma alive and keeps this possibility open. We still live in a world where the path to the end of suffering is still alive, it's still available. It's been taught. It's all. It's been explained. It's simply up to us. We're going to take advantage of it because we can keep coming back, coming back, and after a while, it's not going to be available anymore. But it is available now. So on this full moon night in the month of Wisaka, think back. The Buddha sitting alone under the tree on a full moon night, just like this. It was probably warmer, but it was this time of year. And the moon, looking, if you're, the moon were looking down, what would they see? They see a human being sitting there, looking inside, finding something of real value inside, much more valuable than anything else that anyone has ever found. So now what is the moon looking down on? People who remember him and try to take his lessons, put them into practice, take them to heart. See what you can learn on a night like this. As he said, it involved qualities of heedfulness, ardency, resolution. Even this means seeing that there are dangers, there are the dangers of our own defilements, but we can do something about them. Ardency is when you really do try to do something about them, and resolution is when you stick with it even when it gets hard. That, he said, was what enabled him to gain awakening. And these are qualities that we have too. So when we pay homage to the Buddha, we're also paying homage to the potential for good qualities within ourselves. Make sure it's not just candles and incense that you're using to pay homage to these things, that you're paying homage to them through practicing the Dharma in accordance with the Dharma. In other words, for the sake of disenchantment, for the sake of dispassion. Because that's the proper response to the Four Noble Truths. The Buddha said there are duties with regard to each truth. The duty with regard to suffering is to comprehend it. The duty with regard to the cause of suffering is to abandon it. 
The duty with regard to the cessation is to realize it, and the duty with regard to the path is to develop it. Now those first three all involve dispassion. Because when you really comprehend suffering, you see it's something you're doing. You're clinging to things that you want to cling to, and yet those are the things that constitute suffering. When you realize that, there's a strong sense of dispassion. You look at the craving that leads there. You feel dispassion for that as well. And that's the dispassion that leads to the third noble truth, brings craving to an end. As you solve the problem at the cause. And for the time being, though, we do have to have passion for the path. Make sure that we do it well. And only when it's been completely developed, you put that aside too. When Sariputta, one of the Buddha's main disciples, posed the question one time when you talk to people from a foreign land and they ask you, what does your teacher teach? He says, the first answer you should give is, he teaches the end of passion and desire, the subduing of passion and desire. So that gets at the heart of the Four Noble Truths, and it's good to contemplate that. Because you look around, life is so full of harm that we do to one another as we try to struggle up and then we fall down. And it's largely a question of how much longer do you want to keep involved in this pattern of suffering? When are you going to finally decide that you really do sincerely want a way out? <laughs>